I'm gonna leave the uh, I'm gonna leave the chat box open. Uh, so if you want to uh, if you want to send me questions about this and they're germane to the discussion, I'll happily include them. If they're not germane to the discussion, we'll save it for the we'll save it for later on. All right. So let's uh, let's get started. First, uh, about me, and I apologize. Some of the formatting of this is is suboptimal because I wanted to put it in this in the standard Baruch uh, Baruch format. All right, uh, about me, educated, uh, Harvard BA, 1983, many, many years ago. I have a couple of master's degrees from NYU, one in economics, which wasn't as rigorous as I thought it would be, and uh, another one in statistics and operations research from NYU, which was much more rigorous than I thought it would be, and it put the fear of God in me, but that was a good thing. Uh, I spent 35 years on Wall Street, 14 years at Bankers Trust, five years at Bank of America, nine years at Morgan Stanley. The last three years of my career were at Barclays where I was America's chief risk officer. Uh, it was a great job, Barclays treated me very well. And when I told them it was time to go, I just, they, they made it very easy for me to do it. Uh, I've got experience on the lending side. I did quantitative research for six years at Bankers Trust. I was a trader for a while. It was a lot of fun, but I'm glad I, don't, I'm glad I stopped doing it, it would have killed me and the last 25 years of my career in risk management. Currently, I'm a, um, what's called a distinguished lecturer at Baruch, which means I don't have a PhD, but I do have 35 years worth of experience, which I think is at least the moral equivalent uh, of, a, of a PhD. Um, I teach, I'm an adjunct at NYU. I was an adjunct at Claremont for a number of years uh, at their graduate program. I'm currently an adjunct at Austin Peay State University in Tennessee because uh, I know some people there and they asked me to coach projects. And I'm also an instructor at WorldQuant University, which is an online 100% free master's degree. We have a lot of students from, uh, from Africa in that, which is a very interesting environment. Um, I'm a big jazz guy. I'm a musician. Uh, I'm a big reader, a lot of audio books, a lot of podcasts. If we ever, if things ever get back to normal and you go to the gym, you'll see me there. I will bury you. I go to the gym every day. I'm, I'm not a muscle guy, but I, I'm a, a very big fitness guy. Uh, I got tired of Wall Street in 2018, and I decided that I wanted to be a teacher full-time. I'd been an adjunct at Baruch for, for eight years beforehand. You can call me Ken. If you really want to call me Professor Abbott, that's okay. Or Professor, if you forget my name, that's okay too. Uh, I'm a civilian in the academic military. I have a lot of experience, but I don't have a PhD, but that's okay. I derive my satisfaction from helping you all get jobs. And that is really how I count my successes. There are probably a couple of dozen people at Baruch now or recent graduates who if you ask them how they got their job, they'll say, well, Ken gave me advice on how to think about these positions and gave me stuff to read and coach me on the interview process. If you read my reviews on Rate My Professors, you'll see that's what people tend to say. And that's really what I enjoy doing. And so I have no problem doing this and I'm happy to help any of you. My email address is uh, abbottkc at gmail. Uh, you can use my Baruch address too, kenneth.abbott. But with anything technology, although I'm very happy with the technical support we get at Baruch, the systems associated with uh, CUNY are occasionally suboptimal. So reach me at abbottkc at gmail.com. All right, <clears throat> first question, why finance? <clears throat> why do you want to be in this business? If you're doing this because you see dollar signs, maybe it's time to think. Just, I want you all to give that, this some thought. Chances are you may be, you may be dreaming of, you know, being the uh, person who runs a hedge fund, uh, or or being the the head of uh, the head of a major uh, a major bank, just like people who go into the acting field who think they're going to be next Hollywood movie, you'll you find a career, but it may not be the one you want. And the thing you think you want to do, maybe a whole lot of other people want to do. And so you need to you need to manage your your expectations about that. Which is not to say you shouldn't set your sights high. We have a lot of Baruch people that have been hugely successful. In fact, I'm, I'm working with some people on a fellowship that was sponsored by a Baruch uh, uh, grad who runs his own fund. But it's not everybody gets to the top of the business. The hours are long. You work hard in this business. The work is really really demanding. 
uh, I would get home from a day of meetings and be completely exhausted. All right. The work is stressful. You're, you're meeting, you have to meet deadlines. You have to deal with difficult people. As a matter of fact, the, the hallmark of, of a successful manager is getting people to do things they don't necessarily want to do and getting them to do it efficiently and effectively. Um, if you're not a huge fan of the business and you don't find it inherently interesting, you're going to be competing against people who do, who have a genuine passion, something to think about. But the, there are a lot of good reasons to be in the business, and I'll, and I'll talk about those. You work with a lot of smart, motivated people. Uh, you work on topical projects. Uh, I, there's nothing I found more fascinating than working on a transaction and then reading about it the next day in the Wall Street Journal. And then I'd look at it and I'd say, wow, they, they, Wall Street Journal has no idea what really happened in that transaction. And as somebody who had a, had a, a, a ringside seat for the 2008 financial crisis, I, I could tell you stories of things I saw. Um, it's a challenging work environment. A lot of interesting stuff going on. You're constantly being pushed to do more and more and, and try to get stuff done more and more efficiently and effectively. And, it, and it's really great. I, I just found it to be a, a, a great place and generally meritocratic, not always, but generally, and financially rewarding. Note I put that part last. If you go into this thinking, I'm gonna do this because I wanna get rich, yeah, time to think twice about your career choices. Just because your motivation might not be what is best for you to optimize your career. All right, so. That said, key benefits, make a solid income. I mean, you'll see that analysts out of school, typically 50 to 85. I've seen people with master's degrees come in and start out at over 100K, and often a, a sign-on bonus, a first-year bonus when you join a major firm. Something which those of you, particularly undergrads, may not appreciate at this point in time is that the benefits are usually pretty good. Uh, you will come to appreciate that when you're 26 and you can't get on your parents' medical package any, anymore, or you, you're not eligible for a school medical package. The medical benefits, dental, vision, and employee assistance programs that provide all kinds of advice with respect to life choices and, and, and life challenges. The fabulous benefits at, at big companies. It, it could be a lot of fun. Uh, I, could, I could tell you from personal experience that um, I, I loved what I did. And I, I, it was very rewarding, and I really enjoyed doing it. Get a feeling for the, the income that people make. And, and this is not, I found this in, uh, in financialsamurai.com. And this is not an unrealistic view. The senior people for each of these can, can well exceed, particularly at, at the more senior levels. But this is not an unrealistic view of the kind of, of, the kind of money that people make in this business. Now, you know, the, at the managing director, maybe 5% of all the people in a, in a company are going to be managing directors, but there are plenty of VPs and, and directors that make very good, very good living doing this. Make sense? Anybody questions or comments? You can uh, text me if you have anything you want me to add on this. All right. Other key benefits. You learn to work under pressure. Maybe you're at a major investment bank. You got an institutional client who is a. Uh, oh, hold on. Chat. Try to join again. Just checking the chat to make sure. See the same screen. All right, looks good. All right. Uh, maybe you're working for a big bank and you're working with a client who's trying to trying to break into the ranks. Uh, and you got to go back to the office. I, there are plenty of times when, when I did graduate school, I'd work until six o'clock, I'd go to school, and then after school, I'd go back to work again. So because there was stuff that had to be done, and you learn to prioritize, you learn to get things done quickly and efficiently and effectively. Uh, it toughens you up. Uh, you get to the point, you work on Wall Street for a couple of years, ever, a lot of other things seem relatively, relatively, easy, much more straightforward. Uh, and you get to the point where you can thrive under pressure. I found I did some of my best work under tight deadlines. And that can be very helpful if you want to join a, a startup, you want to work for a, a team someplace, or any organization where you have to produce and you have to be very efficient and effective in, in what you do. All right. Uh, you build endurance and tenacity. Now, 
100 hours a week, I never worked a 100 hour week. I worked some 70, 80 hour weeks, but I never worked a 100 hour week. That tends to be in investment banking. I've seen it in international investment banks, particularly in East Asia, where some of the interns are, are gonna work 100 hour weeks. Um, a lot of firms have changed their views on that. And they've, they've made it a lot more reasonable. They're not putting that kind of expectation. There was some unfortunate incidents at some major banks where they realize they're putting people under too much stress, but that's certainly gotten, gotten better. But you do build up endurance. I mean, now, a 50 hour a week, easy. I did that for many years. And you'll find that, that, that it really does get you to the point where working that hard for an extended period of time seems relatively easy. Uh, one challenge is that people give up too early. They'll say, you know, before it really starts to pay off, uh, and it's a challenge. Uh, some people don't want the pressure. Some people don't want the late nights. So early mornings. Uh, commuting from the suburbs, I got up at 5.30 on a regular basis, took a 6 a.m. train, and got a 6.30 or 7 p.m. train home. So it was, it was a long day. But once you're able to work those days, you get very productive. And, and you can apply that productivity in many other businesses. And the last point here, which I added, guess what? You might actually like it. I found that when I was in my mid twenties, I thrived on the pressure. I thrived on the workload. I really wanted to get stuff done. I wanted to be engaged. I wanted to work hard. Uh, and I think that for many of you in this type of business, you'll find that is the case. You deepen your knowledge. So you get good at understanding trends in the economy, the, the financial economy, the political economy, you understand the way companies behave. When I read earnings announcements, I read strategic plans. I understand what they're doing because I've, I've read dozens of these. And you get good at investing too. I'll talk about that. Uh, you learn to focus on the news in ways that you've never been able to do before. When I read a news article about a transaction, I imagine a dozen similar transactions. I read a private equity deal. I worked on dozens of private equity deals. So. I imagine the discussions that were taking place in the boardroom when that transaction was being finalized, because I know the types of issues that come up in that context. I understand the valuation challenges. I understand the political issues that come up there. And so that, that's very helpful uh, in terms of understanding what's going on. Uh, you have to know your stuff. You're going to add value to the client and you're always ready to meet the next challenge. And when you're constantly challenged, you want to go and do more. That was my experience. You become a better communicator. Communication is one of the key skills to have in finance. And I've found many, many, many times that, and this last point I put here, is that lack of good communication skills keep people out of senior management. So when you start working those kind of hours, you get good at communicating. You get very accomplished at communicating. You learn how to get your point across in clear, effective prose. It's very important. Wall Street forces you to interact with intense people that don't have time for BS. So they want the answer. They need you to tell them what you want to do and why you want to do it and why that's such a good thing to do. You need to speak well, you need to write well, you need to present well. And you can apply those skills in many, many different businesses. All right, you become a better investor. This is something I only realized later on because I spent so much time looking at the markets, I started to think about what I should be doing. And I found that it really, really helped me as an investor. Um, I'm much more confident when I make, a, I, I don't trade often. I rebalance my portfolio once every couple of years. But when I do, it's like, okay, my gut's telling me it's time to do this. I did this in mid-March. Uh, I sold my Morgan Stanley shares at 54 just for it cratered down to 28. Uh, you get a feeling for when panic is about to hit the market and, and you become much more efficient and effective at deploying your own capital. Does that make sense? Anybody questions or comments? Anybody want to post anything? I, I can't see the chat box or it doesn't look like, uh, doesn't look like it. I'm monitoring the chat. I don't see anything coming in right now. Okay, good. All right. Very good. So what are the challenges? if you're new to this. And one of my challenges is my parents didn't have college educations. And I think to, my, to her dying day, my mother probably thought I was a teller. 
because uh, I worked for these big banks. She had no idea what I did. Uh, you may be clueless about what finance is. It's, it looks interesting. It sounds interesting. I mean, I got turned on to it through my economics major. And I said, wow, this sounds really interesting. Of course, I, finance was not a major uh, where I went to college. But it, it's, a, it, it's a trade. It's not a discipline. I think that the, the math that's included in finance is a derivative of, of the math of, of macroeconomics and microeconomics. The world does not necessarily behave the way that you think it's going to behave, all right? The way you read about in textbooks, that's not the way the world works. Uh, when you get into the business, you see the way transactions actually get done. Not everybody behaves in a profit maximizing fashion. Not everybody behaves rationally. Their personal considerations, their political considerations. And so one of the things you realize when you start to work for a bank is that the world doesn't work the way that you've necessarily been taught. And it's really helpful to come to grips with what the potential issues are that come up in that context. You may not have the requisite skills, and we'll talk about that in a second. When I talk about the requisite skills, math, accounting, finance, and some kind of program. You don't have to be a good programmer, but it really helps to have some kind of programming background. I was never a good programmer, but I was a programmer. I programmed database languages many years ago. Why is that important? Because when you're dealing, in finance, you're gonna deal with people in investment, in information technology, in IT. Many times you're gonna make information requests. You need to be able to articulate those requests in a clear fashion. So doing some kind of programming is tremendously helpful in terms of understanding what it is that they do and how to make requests from them. This last thing on this page, you at this point are probably unable to distinguish between the many types of jobs that are out there. Uh, when I was your age, when I was your age, uh, I tended to think that the only jobs that were out there were, uh, um, the only companies were Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan, chemical bank manufacturers, Hanover. There are many, many, many types of financial institutions and firms that rely on the types of skills that you are developing as students at Baruch, all right? You may think that the only types of jobs are to be a, a trading trainee, an investment banking trainee, uh, or, or some kind of, in some kind of consulting role. And it's very important to understand that there are many, many, many different types of jobs that are out there. And it's very helpful to do that. I, I, I teach a course on this, on the different types of businesses, and we cover a lot of the different types of roles that are out there. So what can you do to get yourself ready? First thing you need to do is keep yourself informed about the markets. And this may be one of the things you can look at to determine whether finance is really for you. Because if you're not doing this already, if you, I tend to look at the markets the way that an entomologist looks, you know, somebody who studies insects looks at an ant farm. I'll just look at that ant farm and say, why are they doing that? Let me see if I can understand why they're doing this particular behavior. So you need to keep yourself informed about the markets. How do I do that? Well, if you're an old person like me and you like analog stuff, you might read newspapers. Generally, you go to the financial press though, which is available. I, I tend to get my information on financial markets uh, from the Wall Street Journal, which skews slightly to the right particular, although I find the information generally accurate, certainly the, uh, the op-ed section tends to be a little bit to the right. Uh, the New York Times, which has, it's leaning a little bit more to the left these days. And I also go to Bloomberg. I tend to read Bloomberg as one of the first places I go every day. Mike Bloomberg doesn't care whether I'm right wing or left wing, Mike Bloomberg just wants me to make money. Uh, and so I pay attention to that. And there are also many other web sources that are out there. Uh, um, the Motley Fool is interesting. Uh, Yahoo Finance, I regularly, I, I would give an example of what I do. When I check the markets, I have Yahoo Finance. It tells me, it looks at the, uh, it focuses on the indices in which I'm interested. So what I tend to do is I make sure I know where the US stock indices are, the Dow, the S&P, uh, the NASDAQ. Uh, I look at where Germany is, which is the DAX. I look at the CAC in Paris. I look at the, the Tokyo Stock Exchange. Uh, I might look at the Hang Seng in Hong Kong. I might look at Shanghai. Uh, I, I might look at the, the FTSE English uh, index in, in, uh, in the UK. 
uh, check my web sources for that. Again, Yahoo Finance is pretty good for that. Uh, education wise, not all schools offer traditional finance courses. I could not take finance courses as an undergraduate. You don't have a problem with that at Baruch. So what are the key areas? And I touched on this before. In finance, understanding the notion behind the capital asset pricing model is helpful. Uh, arbitrage pricing theory, portfolio, portfolio theory is very useful to have. Just understand, it helps you understand the motivation of people that trade and people that manage money. In math, calculus helps. Not a requirement, but it helps you think about things. Similarly, linear algebra. If you want to get into the intermediate level of, of portfolio analysis, you really need to have linear algebra. Statistics, I know it's required at Baruch. It's very helpful because we use statistics to look at time series properties of markets. And bond math. Uh, I spend a lot of time in my graduate courses uh, talking about bond math and making sure that people understand the basics of how bonds are priced. And it's essentially, it's an exercise in present value, but it's particularly useful, all right? Accounting, for those of you that aren't accounting majors, and God bless those of you that are, painful but necessary. Do you have to take eight semesters of accounting to, to be successful in finance? No. I took three semesters of accounting, and I found that to be particularly useful. I found that for, for somebody who wasn't an accounting major, for somebody who didn't have an intention of, of being an auditor or being a CPA, I found that three semesters was about right because you obviously take your first year of accounting, basics of financial statement analysis, but then in intermediate accounting, you get a, some of the more advanced concepts. You really need to understand how bad debts expense works. You really need to understand the dynamics of the income expense summary, different depreciation schemes, uh, useful to do. And computer skills. Now, there's a, it's one school of thought that says Excel is, is on its way out. I don't think that's the case. I think there are many other packages that have become very, very useful in this context, Tableau among them, and the many statistics packages that are out there, but computer skills are still very necessary. All right. Third thing is learn about the different types of firms that are out there. And there are many different types. It's not just JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, and Bank of America. On the buy side, there are hedge funds, which are pools, lightly regulated pools of money that are aimed primarily, uh, their clients are primarily wealthy individuals as well as uh, corporations and funds. Mutual funds, which are more, much more heavily regulated, much more retail oriented. Pension funds, which manage money for people's uh, uh, retirement. Endowments, college funds typically. Family offices that manage money for wealthy families. And money managers. Uh, on the sell side, the banks and broker dealers. Many banks have broker dealers that are part of the, the bank holding company. But there are plenty of broker dealers that are independent of banks. The, the example that comes to mind is Jefferies, for example. There's no bank attached to Jefferies, but it's a major broker dealer. There are a lot of firms that provide information about finance and financial markets that offer jobs to people. Bloomberg, Reuters, FactSet. There's a lot of stuff going on out there, all right, that, that people find to be particularly rich sources of employment. Mike Yampol, welcome. Good to see you here. I may call on you to provide some perspective. My, Mike was a classmate of mine uh, at college, and he's been in the business for a long time. Always love to have the perspective of somebody else on this. All right. Government agencies. One of the things I often point out to students when they come to my office and ask about jobs, I go through the different regulatory agencies, and they all have jobs that are out there. The Federal Reserve, the, the Federal Reserve Board, the Federal Reserve Banks, and there are 12 of them in different areas of the country. The Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, the Securities Exchange Commission, FINRA, uh, uh, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. All these places are hiring people. And you need to go to their websites and you need to look at the, at the job offering, offerings that they have and understand what they do. You all need to understand how they work. Uh, the exchanges in addition to which are, which are heavily regulated. You need, to, you need to understand that there are positions out there, you just need to look for them. I had one student who knew nothing about futures markets and knew nothing about commodities, but she looked on a website and she found that there was a commodity futures job out there. So we spent 
one day looking at commodities and one day looking at futures and two weeks later she got the job. So you can get these jobs. You are at least as qualified for these jobs as anyone else that is applying. You need to keep that in mind. The web is your best resource. And there's a lot of junk on the web. I find that Investopedia is actually a pretty good source, pretty consistently. And also Wikipedia. If you wanted to get up to speed, if you called me tonight and said, Ken, I need to learn about hedge funds, I'd say, first go to Wikipedia. Wikipedia has some fine entries, a, a fine section on hedge funds. Now, don't use Wikipedia for your paper because I'll take, I'll take off a lot of points for using Wikipedia. You have to go to the ultimate sources when you're writing a paper on that. But I think that using them as sources to find out about different industries, very helpful, very useful. Fourth, learn about the types of positions that are out there. Are you a quantitative analysis? Are you a credit analyst? Market risk are in the financial information thing. There are people that do reporting. They look at transactions. So there are different types of positions. I'm happy to help you with this. Uh, in fact, I've spent a lot of time with students going through this kind of thing saying, please send me, uh, uh, send me the job description and I'll tell you what I know about the types of jobs that are out there. Um, in general, this is my opinion. I'm not a fan of getting vague cover letters. You have to, you have to take a very broad based approach, but if you're going to send out a lot of cover letters, get the names right and don't be cute when, when you write about it. Now, when I say get the names right, what does that mean? Well, <clears throat> I once gave a, a talk about the job market at a graduate program, uh, when I was at Morgan Stanley. And I got an email from somebody who attended that asking me about jobs at my company, Golden Sachs. And I just didn't, uh, I didn't follow up on that. Uh, understand the support functions. For every job in the front office, trader, banker, transaction person, all right, there are typically anywhere between two and 10 jobs in the support functions, in the middle office, in the back office. Uh, and we could talk about those. I teach a course on this in the fall on what the support functions do. Operations, market risk, credit risk, operational risk, finance. Compl when I say finance, this is the, largely the accounting function. Compliance, treasury, legal, audit, tax, many other groups. You need to understand what these things are. Not every job on Wall Street is a trading job or a banking job. There are many, many, many positions that exist in the support functions. You need to understand what those people do, how they make a living, what the key elements are for them to do their jobs uh, on a regular basis. Um, on. Keep abreast of the job market. These are just some of the places you can look when, when you're out there. Hold on, there's a, a bunch of entries in the chat. Uh, Sandra, Sandra makes the observation that Vault has a lot of stuff out there. Um, let me see if there's anything else. I'll talk a little bit about the whole COVID situation. That that's very very tricky. Uh, all right, this, this is a this is a, a a question about how we keep up with different positions that are out there, and, and and which ones you're eligible for. I would say that these places are my primary go-to sources. Oh, let me move. I'm trying to adjust my screen so I can see the questions as they're coming in. There we go. Um, I have blogs twice. Sorry about that. Blogs. You go out there like quantnet.com, uh, wallstreetoasis.com. People click as jobs. GARP lists jobs. So does Premier, the Risk Management Association. Bloomberg. Go to Bloomberg and type J-O-B-S. You'll see what, uh, you'll see what people you see what positions people are posting for. Friends and family are very good sources and LinkedIn. Now, a lot of these job ag aggregation sites, uh, and I'm sure many of you have, have dealt with this, you'll submit a resume and you won't hear anything from that. Some of them get better. Every once in a while, you'll, you'll get called back. But if you look at these places, you'll see the types of jobs that, that are available to people. Don't be afraid to ask. If you have questions, if you have questions, reach out to me, reach out to someone. Uh, Kara, this might be a chance for me to take some questions from people. Any questions you think are particularly, particularly important that have come? Ms. Petridis, hold on one second, I'm sorry. 
yeah, so a couple of things came in. So um, one was some questions on how you actually keep up with all of these different um, positions that are out there and what area they belong to within the industry, like how one could kind of keep up with that. I think this is where the internet becomes a particularly useful resource. You look at you look Sorry at LinkedIn, that. Got... You look LinkedIn jobs. Now you you might not be able oh, to give your resume. Yeah, I've been just sitting here for so long. But you, you look at the job. Um, no, but that's great to hear. I'm 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 happy because I, you know, I emailed her. But Kara, you might want to mute. All right. So what you want to do is you want to look at the titles of the people that are that are of the jobs that are out there. I, we're hiring for a research analyst. We're hiring for somebody to work at a family office. And then you do research on what is a family office. I had one of my students, um, actually, an interesting call. I got a call from a friend of mine who works for a wealthy family. And there are a lot of there are a lot of people out there that manage the money for very wealthy families. And she said, Ken, I need someone. And I said, well, look, let me, uh, let me talk to my students. And I had one student who, uh, who was perfect for the job, but she had to learn what the family office did. And so we spent some time looking on the internet for how those jobs worked. And now uh, she just got a, she went from being an intern there to uh, being a full-time employee there. Why? Because we found out about it. We did research and she asked me about it. And we spent a lot of time looking at it. Does that make sense? What else, Kara? What else do you think? Uh... All right. Natasha wants to know the email and full name of the professor, Ken Abbott. So it's abbottkc at gmail.com if you have any questions. Uh, Marietta points out the internet is also a firm that are, yes, Marietta, thank you. That's actually very useful to, to know. There are lots of companies that are out there uh, that do this. Kara, anything else you want to, uh, any other questions you want to put to me? Yeah, so there was actually, um, Sandy from our office had actually asked about the Bloomberg Market Concepts training at the library, if you know anything about that and if you yes, think that is something useful. Bloomberg, there are lots of places where you can get good training out there. Uh, now, the, the challenge with using Bloomberg is that if you don't have ready access to a Bloomberg terminal, it's, and, and we're going to be challenged this fall, depending on what happens, it's, unless you can get to a place that has a Bloomberg, you can learn a lot of the basics, but the basics there tend to be Bloomberg specific. I find that some of the better training sources out there, uh, the, the government regulators have good training on markets. Uh, Khan Academy has good training uh, on markets. Money Week has a series of about 100 videos. Uh, and I will post those to if, if people are interested. Um, there's a lot of stuff out there. If you have questions, s send me an email on that. And, I, and, I, and I'm, happy to, I'm happy to recommend places, uh, places to look there. Now, this, uh, Julio just points out there's a study from Chicago about uh, reallocation. I've actually just been engaged by the Office of Management and Budget to find some people at Baruch that want to study the impact of COVID on, uh, on the macro economy. That's a, something I've, I've contacted the Dean about to see if we can find some people to help us with that. Um, any, anything else you want me to cover before I move on, Kara? I think you can move on. I'll collect some more for you in a little bit. Good. All right. Other things to do. All right. Prepare yourself for interviews. First thing you should go to is the company's website. If you get a if you get a job at, if you get an offer from a sorry if you get an interview from a company, go to their website and see what they have to say about themselves. Another place to look at their regulatory filings, particularly their their 10K and their 8K. You can get these off the S, uh, SEC website, the Edgar website. You want to make sure you're aware of any regulatory issues, anything that's going on in the news. So you you do a search on the company. Uh, you want to get your resume ready. So in terms of getting ready for an interview, if you put it on your resume, you have to assume they're going to ask you about it. I've seen plenty of people come and say, well, look, I, I, portfolio optimization. Now, I happen to know something about portfolio optimization. And I said, uh, okay, tell me about that. And they said, well, it was just a, a program I used. I really didn't understand the, the way it worked. <clears throat> Instant ding. Uh, if, if you put it on your resume, expect to be asked about it, all right? Uh, don't get cute. I had one person say, proud member of XYZ fraternity, happened to be a fraternity that had just gotten shut down for misbehavior, didn't want to see that. Use spell check, 
Now this one's a do as I say, not as I do. I found a spelling error on, uh, on my resume, the one that ultimately got me a job, but you spell check. Align the tabs, make your resume easy to look at. Don't cram too much information. Uh, in terms of resume, I believe that the, the only person, if you're, unless you're writing an academic resume where you have to list all the papers that you've published, your resume should be one page, right? Declaration of Independence, one page. Magna Carta, one page. Your resume, one page. The exception I've made to that is, is George Bush Sr. He was uh, ambassador to the UN and ambassador to China and head of the CIA and vice president of prison. I'll spot him a two page resume. But for most people at the, at the undergraduate level, I would say it probably makes sense to have a one page resume. Some people only have a half page resume and then we have to talk about ways of making it, making it a little more fulsome. Is it, is it a problem if you haven't had four internships at bulge bracket banks? No, you, a lot of times companies realize that not everyone gets those jobs. After my sophomore year in college, I made pizza. After my junior year in college, I was a proctor at the summer school. So I'm, I'm living proof of the fact that companies don't necessarily assume that you had that 12 week internship at Goldman Sachs. So something to think about. Don't leave date gaps. Don't, you know, if you had a, a, a job from 2016, and this is more for people that are experienced. Um, if you say, you know, 2012, 2014, and then 2016 to 2018, I'm gonna ask what happened 2000, 2016 to 2018? I mean, what happened in that time gap? Um, so generally you wanna make sure that you, you fill that out. If you're not a native English speaker, and I fully appreciate that many of you may not be, and that's okay, you want to have someone who is a native English speaker review your resume to make sure that it reads well. I'll tell you a true story. Uh, I met a guy from Chile who had an interesting resume, and I gave it to a friend of mine at Morgan Stanley who also happened to be from Chile. He took one look at it, and uh, I came down later, it was in the trash. And I said, why'd you throw it out? He said, you know what? It had bad English. And he, he said, I came here from another country and I, 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 learned, I learned the language and I want other people who come here to, be, to work as hard as I did learning it. Um, so you, you, have to be very, you have to be very careful about making sure that your grammar and spelling are correct. Now, another key thing here, under no circumstance should you misstate anything. I can, I've got a handful of stories I can tell you about people that failed to put things on there. Um, I know of someone who unfortunately had an, uh, an undergraduate incident of, uh, of underage drinking and she was, uh, she was caught and she didn't put it on her resume. She got a job at Goldman Sachs and the second day they found out about it and they escorted her out. I could tell you about plenty of times when people who did have minor incidents was not a big deal. They disclosed it. They said, this is what happened and people moved on. Uh, but if you just, if you fail to disclose something and they find out about it, you will lose your job. All right. Let me move on from here. When you do get an internship, and I keep saying this, if you're unsure, ask, check your work. Check it twice, check it three times, check it four times, spell check it. Make sure it's as clean as it possibly can be. Dress professionally, get to know people. Now, it, this is hard to do in an age of COVID. I, I fully appreciate that it's hard to, to get around and get to meet people, but go out of your way, call people, set up Zoom appointments, keep yourself busy. Things not to do. If you get a job in sales and trading, don't spend all your time looking for a position in investment banking or in wealth management. The people that manage you will notice that and they talk about it. And every time it happened in risk management, we were very well aware of it because the people are gonna come to us, say, hey, we, this person from, uh, uh, from your area keeps coming to me to ask about full-time positions there. It's okay to network, but don't, don't lobby, don't work it so hard that people notice. Don't spend too much time on the internet if you're actually there in, uh, in, uh, in the office. I've seen people's career get derailed from that. 
If you're at the desk, don't wear headphones at the desk and pretend you're not, you don't care about what's going on. And again, this is different in the age of COVID when people are working from home. Assume that every time you are speaking, you're presenting. Assume that when you are not speaking, you are also presenting. Make sure that you are always behaving in a professional capacity. Don't gossip, don't send smarmy emails. And this last one, don't enjoy yourself too much at outings. And I don't know what kind of outings people are having, but I can tell you more than one person's candidacy who had a, a few too many drinks at the outing and uh, they did not, uh, their employment did not continue for too much longer. So just some observations there. All right, any other questions or comments? Kara, that we wanna take here? Yeah, a few things have been coming in. Um, so one question that was pretty interesting was your thoughts on if there have been new positions created due to COVID and the current pandemic, maybe permanent changes, if you see any in the finance industry as a result. In the finance industry, it's hard to say that I, I've seen from, from, what, from what I've heard, because and I'm, I'm in touch with my friends all the time. I mean, I, I, I talk to my friends multiple times a week about what's going on. And as far as I can tell that the, the fundamental nature of the of positions in the business, the hiring process so far has been similar, if, if curtailed a bit. What I will say is that there are new, there are new analyses and, and new positions that, that have come up. I, I, I'll give an example. Uh, somebody from the Office of Management and Budget, which is the auditing group within, uh, within the federal government, reached out to me and said, Ken, we're about to, we're about to make public a trove of data and we need people to help us analyze it. We need people to help us build tools in Tableau or in, in web-based graphics in order to, to be able to digest this data because there's all this spending that's going on and the Office of Management and Budget needs to understand what's driving that spending, whether it has an impact. And so I've reached out to the people at the Mark School and the people in the graduate program. And the reason I'm not necessarily focusing on undergrads at this time is because this may require some analytical skills. I may em employ some of my honor students to, to look at this. But there are all kinds of jobs like this that are going to come out. Now, are these going to be, are these research opportunities or paying jobs? Could be both. And I think there's going to be all kinds of things, opportunities that are going to be presented by measuring and managing the impact uh, of, of COVID on the economy and on the financial markets. What else, Kara? What uh, else? We could, we could throw in one more. Um, so another student had posted a course that they're taking on financial modeling at the Corporate Finance Institute. And then some other students were just asking if that sounded like something that would be, that you would recommend. It's not a free course. I have been, and I, I, there's a lot of good stuff out there and there's a lot of bad stuff out there. I have been pleasantly surprised at the quality of the material I've seen come out of the Corporate Finance Institute. And in my web searches, and I, I do a lot of this kind of research, uh, I found that material to be pretty good. I can't speak to whether the course is good. I can tell you that whoever is designing those courses appears to be picking the right topics to examine. Because when I read the summary material that I get from them, think, as somebody who, who spent literally decades in the business, um, I said, wow, that was pretty good. They, they understood it. So I, I, I can't endorse the course because I, I haven't, I, I'm not familiar enough with it at this point in time. I can tell you that the material I've seen come out of the Corporate Finance Institute uh, appears to be high quality. There's another question I, I just saw come in about CFA, and this, this also uh, is relevant to things like the, uh, the FRM, and there are various certifications out there. Now, this is my opinion, uh, and I, I'll identify it as that. I think that the FRM with the Financial Risk Management designation and the CFA uh, and the CFP, there are, there are lots of things that are out there you can get. You could do them, but you will not learn the material as well now if you're an undergraduate because you don't have the institutional context. You simply don't have the experience to be able to absorb the material that's coming in. Could you pass the test? Yeah, you probably could. 
because you're, you're professional students now. That's what you do. And you know how to study material to take tests. I find that these designations are often better once you've had a couple of years of experience. First of all, your motivation is completely different. Now, you, if you're an undergraduate in particular, your motivation to study is to get a good grade because that's all you've been doing your whole life is studying to try to get good grades. And, and you're studying material because you, the prize you see is getting the, the B plus or the A minus or the A at, at the end. At the graduate level, once you're out for a couple of years, your motivation is completely different. My motivation in graduate school was completely different than my motivation as an undergrad. I had no idea why I was doing what I was doing as an undergrad. I did it because it was interesting. When I was in grad school, and this, this applies to things like the CFA and the FRM, because they are, as far as I'm concerned, the CFA is the equivalent of an MBA. I would say the same thing about the FRM now, too, in terms of the, the qualification that it gives you, the amount of knowledge. It's much easier to learn that material, and you're much more motivated to learn that material when you understand why it is that you're learning it. At, in graduate school, I'd, I'd learn it one day and apply it the next. And that was very useful from a career standpoint. It helped me tremendously because I was able to apply things immediately. It's not a bad thing. More knowledge is never a bad thing. But I would say it makes more sense with these certifications to, to wait until you're employed to do that. Now, let me ask Sandra and Marietta whether you have a, a, a different opinion on that, because I'm happy to entertain, uh, I'm happy to entertain other views on that. If there's one thing I've learned, it's that I, I don't have a monopoly on, on, on metaphysical truth. And if anyone has any different opinions on that, I'm, I'm happy to hear that. Now, Natasha has a point here. If you're feeling your lack of knowledge in Excel modeling is absolutely necessary, um, let me see if I can see it. I find Excel to be a very useful skill. You're going to have to learn it one way or the other. Uh, I talk to my financial engineering students. I say, you may think you're going to be coding in C++ all the time. If you're a computer science person, you may well be. But if you're not, chances are a great deal of your work is going to be in, in, in basic spreadsheets. Uh, advice on dealing for employment during COVID. I think that Look, these are unprecedented times. People are very uncertain as to how things are going to be, how things are going to be uh, evolving going forward. A lot of jobs have gone virtual. Now, you have to realize that the primary reason, in my opinion, the primary reason a lot of firms hire interns is not because you're going to uncover the next great thing that the company is going to use to make beans and ours. They want to use it as a way to try before they buy in terms of hiring. The primary purpose of firms managing internship programs is to save time and effort on the hiring process. So it's in their interest to maintain these programs. I think that go about the job search function the way you normally would, because some companies, look, some companies are going to have to curtail their hiring because of this, because the economic activity may slow. But it's been my experience that companies are, are doing as best they can to engage people because they want to see the people that that they want to hire. Uh, I just met, I helped a, a couple of students get interviews, and I haven't heard the result of them. Uh, and they got through the final round of Credit Suisse, and they are. This is for next year. They're quite anxious to maintain these programs. All right. Now, uh, an, another very good question came in: Is how do you know the the path you choose within finance if you haven't had any relevant experience to make this choice? And again, this is sort of an unconventional view, but I believe that your first job, for those of you that are golfers, and I'm not, but I know about this, your first job is a mulligan. Your first job is a throwaway. Your first job in finance should be to figure out whether finance is right for you. My first job was in the, on the commercial lending side as a credit analyst. I realized that this is not what I wanted to do. Uh, uh, and I realized after, after I did that for, for a year or two, uh, I got uh, invited to join the sales and trading operation where I got the chance to see what it was I really wanted to do. And then that worked out quite well for me. I think that the first job you get in finance is to learn the ropes, to get your foot in the door, to get something to put on your resume. 
and figure out, once you get that job, you'll learn very quickly what it is that these companies do. All right, Kara, anything else you want me to cover before I move on? Uh, I don't think there's any others that have come in. All right, so I'll make a couple of observations uh, and, and I'll, I'll talk about things to think about. Uh, I talked about this before, lifestyle. And again, I wanna be realistic. You have to be prepared to make sacrifices. These are not nine, these are not the nine to five, this is not the nine to five job that my father had. My father didn't have a college, my father didn't finish high school. Uh, um, but the type of job that I got was very, very different. I did not leave, I never left at five o'clock. You have to be prepared to make sacrifices. That said, family is important. You have to, you have to, once you're, once you start a family, you have to think about those priorities. The stress is insidious and it can really get you. You have to learn how to manage the stress. Joining the gym is a very important thing, I, I, I would say there. You have to learn to separate uh, uh, work life from home life. You have to remember who you are. You have to keep track of your hobbies and interests. I'm a musician. Um, there was a period of a couple of years when I, when I was unable to pursue much musically. But then at some point, working after working for like two years, I said, I have to get back into this because I wanted to make sure that I maintained who it was that I was. Uh, um, you have to leverage your company's benefits package. There are all kinds of things that companies, companies make available to you. You need to take advantage of that. All kinds of discounts, uh, museum stuff. As Baruch students, you can get into museums. You can, all kinds of other stuff you can do. Uh, people. You learn a lot about people when you start working in, in the business world. Uh, Money often attracts the unethical. You'll see that people's ambitions conflict. Uh, you'll see that people often do things that they don't think are right, but because that it's the right thing for them to do, sometimes that'll take them down a path that they don't necessarily want to go down. I, I warn you about this early on. You'll learn that people are stubborn, that a lot of your job is convincing people to do things that they don't necessarily want to do. There are some remarkable junior people I got to know at Morgan Stanley and at Barclays, and they had the magical skill of getting people to do things that they didn't want to do without getting them angry. And every time I encountered these people, I went to their boss, I said, you need to be aware this person has the knack. This person has the skill uh, to do that. And these people have uniformly done well learning how to deal with people, it's, it's hard to, you can't learn it in a management MBA class. It's something you, you often develop uh, um, just with experience. Organizations, big organizations are, are complicated. They're far, far more complicated than academia, for example. I had somebody post a question to me on, on, uh, on Quantnet, one of the finance blogs, who said, I'm trying to understand why these titles aren't uniform. In, in the academic world, you've got lecturers, you've got associate professors who are non-tenured, assistant, sorry, assistant professors who are non-tenured, associate professors who are tenured, but are still junior faculty. You've got full professors and you've got, uh, you, you've got deans. The world is very, very well defined, all right? And, and very standardized. And there, are there differences between Places uh, between titles, yes, but pretty much uniform throughout academia. Once you get into the business world, positions are wildly different from each other, from firm to firm. A VP may have a completely different job at Goldman Sachs than the same person would have at Morgan Stanley or at Fidelity Funds. So big organizations are very, very complicated and do things in a very different way you'll be appalled at the organizational challenges. You'll walk and say, I can't believe that they're this uninformed about the way they do things. And it's just something that we experience. IT is bad everywhere. And I say this to my students all the time. You will be shocked at how bad bank systems are. You'll think all oh, these banks, they have their act together, obviously. They, they must have been dealing with, uh, with billions of dollars. Um, well, that is simply not the case. In general, bank systems across the board are all terrible. And banks spend billions of dollars. The, the, why is that? How can this be? Well, businesses are set up to make profits and it's businesses are often set up in silos. 
and the systems don't talk to each other. Goldman Sachs got this right with SecDB, but now I'm understanding that their, their primary golden source database is having challenges on its own. Most banks are just terrible at this. Within organizations, roles conflict. You will find that two people are working with different sets of priorities. They're supposed to be working on the same project, but one is supposed to ex be extending the project's capability across many different teams, and another person's job is to make sure that it works really well for one team, and you have to reconcile that. Roles often conflict. Organizations can be unfeeling. That unlike at school, the company's job is not to develop you. All right. At Baruch, our job is to make you as good as you can be. Our focus is on you. That's our job. If we're not doing stuff for you, we're not doing our jobs. Once you get out in the working world, the focus isn't on you anymore. It's on the company. And so you have to keep that in mind. Just because you're not developing the way you want to be, you can't necessarily go to somebody in HR and say, you're not doing your job. You will see conflicting agendas in the working world you will see unresolvable conflicts. Um, you'll see think, instances when you have to put your personal goals against those of the company. You may be find a particular area really interesting and that's what you want to focus on, but the company doesn't want, you, doesn't want you to do that. They want you to do something else that maybe you're not as interested in. Guess what? The company wins because they're paying your salary. If you don't like that, you have to consider, you have to consider whether you want to stay there. My view when I've been asked to do things or get involved in things I didn't want to do is I complain twice and then you vote with your feet. Complain once, they might not hear you or you, 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 you talk to somebody about it twice and then you have to decide whether it is you want to stay at the firm. You're going to see regulators, particularly in finance, with different priorities. You're going to see regulators that are unreasonable and you'll say, how can they be this way? Uh, I will note with, with some amusement that the most unpleasant regulator I ever had to deal with is a proud graduate of Baruch. I, I will not mention his or her name, but you will deal with regulators that are unreasonable. And you'll see senior people make bad decisions. I used to think that the senior people, they were like the gods on Mount Olympus when I, when I was uh, in my 20s. Like, wow, they're really senior. Then, then I got to be one of the senior people. I said, the, the difference between the junior people and the senior people is not the senior people are so much better or smarter. This is just more experience. You will see plenty of people make bad decisions. And it happens all the time. Advancement. Again, you'll see selfish, ambitious people. Meritocracy, usually the rule, not always. You'll see people cheat to get ahead uh, or, or misstate things or inflate their own role. I've been the victim of that a few times. It is what it is. My answer to some of these is don't necessarily be in a hurry. I think one of the challenges, and I see this with my own children, is that right now, your time frame is built on two to four year units. You know, four years, four years of high school, four years of college, maybe a little more, all right? It's a, it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. You need to take your time. Take your time in terms of developing yourself. Find the right path. Don't be in a hurry to get someplace too quickly. I've seen many careers derailed because somebody sought a promotion, sometimes they got it before they're ready for it. And they got all this responsibility heaped on them. They didn't have the experience they needed to do it. So this, this idea of getting promoted before you're ready, be aware of it. It's, you you want to make sure that you're ready to take on um, additional responsibilities. If you're constantly comparing yourself to other people, you're always going to be, you're always going to be picking yourself apart. And, and that can be a problem. And so you don't necessarily want to compare yourself to people all the time. So just be aware of that. It's hard not to compare yourself to people. And I think that, that it's something we naturally do, but, but it's a challenge. All right? And the last observation I make on this slide, pick your battles. A lot of times you're going to get into an argument with somebody about something and you're going to say, you know, I, I might win this, but the cost would be too high. So I'm, I'm not going to fight it. That's, that's an observation that I've made along the way. Manage your expectations. You could be the best student in the world. Once you're on the job, you're in the bottom rung of the ladder. All right? Uh, something else, uh, some of your best work will go unappreciated. But the flip side of that is that 
sometimes the easy stuff makes you a star. There are some things I did. I, I don't know if you, you, you all remember the movie, uh, A Beautiful Mind. When, when he was uh, given the Nobel Prize, he couldn't believe the thing he was given the Nobel Prize for. He said, well, what about this other stuff that I did? It was really good. That will happen to you at work. You'll do, you'll do something you think is just really groundbreaking and no one will appreciate it. On the other hand, some, there are on numerous occasions, little one-off projects I did that I really didn't think about that much. And they ended up being the things that got me noticed. And I was shocked that it happened that way. You'll be surprised. Um, not all your bosses and, and coworkers will be trustworthy. I hate to say that, but it's true. Sometimes you will find, and I've seen this in, in people, people that you work for whose primary interest is not necessarily in developing you, but in developing their own careers at maybe at your expense. And I've seen that happen many, many times. It's happened to me a couple of times. Uh, I'm proud to say that I have often promoted people out from under me when I would have done better to have them work for me, but they were great people and their next career move had to be working for someone else. And you hope you, you your bosses think that way but don't assume that they will. Take the long view. Very important to take a very long-term view of how the world works. All right, hierarchy of an investment banks. Uh, uh, what, there's a question from, uh, from someone about, do, do firms have internal mobility? Yes, they do. Firms do have an internal mobility programs. Can you move from one area to another? Yes, you can, but it's easier if that's done with a pull than with a push. Basically, you want to network, you want to make sure people understand what it is you do and, and what you're good at. If you push yourself out and, and market yourself from one area to another, your boss will find out about it and say, why does this person want to leave my team? The way you, the best way for it to work is to socialize, get your work out there, get involved in meetings, get involved in, in social groups and get to know people. What the way it worked for me was I did some work that was, I thought, decent work, and it got out that I did decent work, and then somebody left my group, a senior person went to work for another group, he said, I want Ken to come down and work with us. That's the easiest way to facilitate, to facilitate internal mobility. Almost all the jobs I've had have been positions where somebody asked me to move from one area to another. It's much easier to do it that way. That has been, that has been my experience. All right. What is the hierarchy in investment banking? And it's a little different on the consulting side. And if people are interested in that, let me know. I could send them stuff. But for most firms, analyst, associate, vice president, this next title varies. I've seen all four of these, executive director, director, principal, senior vice president. All right. Um, usually this is before. Sometimes senior vice president is the equivalent of managing director. Sometimes it's not. This is the typical hierarchy within an organization. The percentages vary very heavily. I get the MD, three to eight percent of a firm will be managing directors, maybe 10, 15 percent here, and then it, it really varies. And some firms, and some firms it's very hard to become a vice president, and other firms it, it's not as hard to become a vice president. So what is an analyst? An analyst does intelligent, unskilled labor. Maybe you're a, a computer science major doing basic programming. Maybe you're just doing fixing pitch books in PowerPoint. You're learning the ropes. You're learning how to manipulate PowerPoint slides. You're doing reporting. You're doing fundamental research. A lot of time in Excel, if you're on the financial market side, doing work with Visual Basic. Or maybe you're doing database work. Learning how SQL works is very helpful if you're looking at traditional uh, management data, management information. The time and grade here is typically you'll spend two, three, sometimes four years as an analyst. After you're an analyst, you become an associate. All right. This is your first promotion is typically to, to associate. It's like an analyst. The job is like an analyst, but you have a little more responsibility. Often you're going to have a couple of analysts that work for you. You know your way around. And so you help the analyst figure out where information is, where the bathroom is, where the cafeteria is where to get information. They'll say, you'll say, don't talk to that person. They're not very helpful. They'll be too busy. Go talk to this person because they know where the information is. 
they're accountable for quality control. I expect the associates to look after the analysts. If there's a problem with the work that the analysts did, the first person I'm gonna to go to is the associate and say, did you check that, all right? I'm gonna to wanna to see that you can work independently. I'm gonna see, I'm gonna to wanna to see that your work doesn't necessarily require the close proofreading that I might, that I might get, uh, uh, that I might have to do for an analyst. I expect you to be able to be facile with Excel models and VBA and to work pretty well with databases. Again, the time here, two, three, four, sometimes five years, generally at least two years. All right. Um, question comes in with MBA. Generally, I'd expect you to come in as an associate, but sometimes firms are going to offer you an analyst role. If you have, if you, if you're an MBA and you have no experience, so you went straight from undergrad to graduate school and somebody offers you a job as an analyst, you might take that job. If the money's right, you might take that job. So again, your first job, it doesn't matter that much. Generally with an MBA, I'd assume that most MBAs come in with experience. I would assume that MBAs would take just starting jobs as associates as opposed to analysts. Alexander, I hope that answers your question. Uh, do I recommend going for a master's right after college? Now, in general, I think it's very important to get work experience. I'm not gonna, I know Baruch likes to get people to come and do that master's program right away and they'll, they'll guarantee you. In, in general, if you're gonna do that, you better work the job market really hard. You better pursue things really aggressively. I find that I would rather, when I hired people with master's degrees, the first thing I looked at is where did they work? Because one reason is I want to know they have a genuine interest in finance. As I mentioned before at the beginning of this, a lot of people join the business for the wrong reason. Um, they do it because they think they're going to get to the top really quickly. They do it because they're going to think they're going to make big bucks in the first couple of years. I can read that out. I want to look for a genuine interest. In general, I like to see people getting experience after that. And it's important to you too. You need to prove to yourself that this is what, something you want to do. I've seen plenty of people that come into the business and they end up topping out in, in middle management because it's not where their passion is. Can they do it well enough to, to, to earn a living? Yes, but it's not really what they, what they want to be doing. I think that most people think about graduate school after two to five years, sometimes a little longer. I started graduate school six years. Actually, I take that back. I actually started, I took some graduate courses two years out of school. Uh, and then I put it away for four years. And after six years, I was ready to go to graduate school. After six years, I knew what it was, what it is. I knew, I knew what I didn't know. I knew how I was, I needed, I knew what I needed to learn. And that's when I pursued graduate school. And my motivation was completely different. I worked really, really hard because I really wanted to learn the material. If you take the right graduate program, uh, one of the things I loved about the graduate programs I pursued is they were fat free. There were, there were no BS courses. Generally, every course I had to take was a useful course. And you want to be, uh, you want to understand why this course is useful. So again, uh, associates, basically analysts with more experience take on a little more responsibility. Vice president is where the first cut takes place. Vice presidents are accountable and they're independent. A person who worked for me, worked with me, worked with me, he didn't work for me. I was very senior at, at Barclays and I was working with this person who was an associate and I found that I would give him direction. I'd say, go do this. And he would come back to me a couple days later and it would be done and he would get it. And I went to his boss when he was up for vice president. I went to his boss and I said, he is ready to be a vice president because he worked really, really well independently. I gave him direction. He took the work. He got it done. He gave it to me. It was, it was quality work, uh, and he was ready to be a vice president. So independence is a key thing for a vice president. Management, can you manage people? Um, do people like working for you? Do you provide them with the right amount of direction? Do you, do you delegate enough? That's very important. Uh, I expect vice presidents to be subject matter experts in some area. Uh, I would expect... I would go to my vice presidents. If they, put, if they gave me a paper on something, I expected it to be clean. I expected them to know what they were doing. 
I expect them to be experts in their areas. Um, and a couple of questions, I'll get to them in a second. I expect them to have uh, presentation skills. I took one person in, and this is a true story. I, 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 he was the vice president. He'd been a vice president for a long time. Quirky person, great guy. And I took him in front of the chairman, the chairman of the board. And he gave a presentation and the chairman came up to me after and said, that was the best presentation on this particular area I have ever seen. And I went to this person, this person worked for me, but I went to his boss and said, we have to get this person promoted because he did a superb job present. He'd been vice president for a long time. Now he's a director. He's at Barclays. He got promoted on the strength of his presentation skills. I expect vice presidents to manage staffing issues. Tell, them, tell me how many people we need to do a particular job, where those people are doing a good job. And I expect vice presidents to be able to design reports. Directors where you start getting into senior management. I expect you to manage teams. When you're, when you're a director, executive director, senior vice president, I expect you to be able to manage a group of people. Could be five people, could be 50. But I expect you to tell me the work dynamic. I don't expect you to do the work yourself. I expect you to be able to leverage yourself. You're gonna manage groups of people. You're going to guide projects. You're gonna be given guidelines. This is what needs to be done. You're gonna to have to go figure out how it is that, that it should be done. I would go to my directors and say, okay, this is what I need done. Within a week, I wanna plan on how we're gonna do this. Uh, and, and that's what they had to do. I expect them to be able to prioritize. I expect them reliably to be able to give presentations or to write a presentation for me to give. I did this very commonly. I'd go to my direct say, give me a presentation that covers A, B, C, and D. It's gotta be 10 to 20 pages long, get it to me by next week. And he or she would put that presentation together and I would be able to, with minimal editing, go and present it. That would be something that I would expect them to be able to do. I would regularly expect my directors to be able to go in and talk to the regulators without my being there. I would not necessarily expect a vice president to be able to carry out a meeting on their own with the Federal Reserve. Director, yes. I would say, you manage that meeting, you call me in if you need me. Project delivery, I expect, I expect people to be able to get projects done. Time and grade, typically here, at least three years. The soonest I've seen anyone go from analyst to vice president is four years. Uh, I did it in five, some people do it in six or seven, but generally that's the time between you get from, from an analyst to a vice president. People can stay a vice president for 10 years, 15 years. Um, directors, in some firms it's up or out. Either you become somebody they wanna to promote to managing director or they push you out the door. Managing director, is generally the top, uh, the, the top rung of the ladder. I like him man being a managing director to sitting at the top of a flagpole. Uh, when the weather's great and the wind's not blowing, the view is great. It's more fun working than, than, than managing, but, it, but the problem is when you're a managing director, you're accountable. As a managing director, as a senior manager, anything that went wrong, even if it was my, wasn't my fault, it was my fault. As the chief risk officer for the Americas in Barclays, if there was a problem in the accounting area, guess what? It was at least partially my problem. Problem in HR, my problem. Problem in, in IT, my problem. Ultimately, I was accountable. In terms of projects, I was expected not just to manage projects, I was expected to identify the projects which needed to be done. I was given a blank slate, figure it out. If I didn't figure out what needed to be done, I was accountable, it was my fault. Uh, as a managing director, you're expected to be able to make presentations to the board, to senior management. As, a, as an MD, I made presentations to the, to the president of the bank, I make presentation to the CEO and to the chair on a regular basis. I was expected to manage budget and identify the long-term needs of the company. All right, I had a couple of questions come in there. Uh, is negotiable if with the firm offered an analyst role with MBA degree two, three years ago? It depends. I would say if, if you're offered an analyst role at an analyst salary with two or three years work experience, I might not take that job. Uh, if I'm offered an analyst role and, and the money's right, 
I would say, well, they're calling it analyst, but they're paying me like an associate. So I would consider taking that job. All right, are there IT opportunities um, in the finance sector? Yes, there are many. Are. I mean, a key part of banking, investment banking, commercial banking, sales and trading is management of information and, and being useful in terms of being able to, get, able to get information and being able to put information together across from many different sources and being able to, pr to present it, a key skill. Somebody asked me what classes I teach. I'm teaching an honors seminar on uh, business analytics, basically going to be quantitative analysis for non-quants. I'm teaching a course on control functions, market risk, credit risk, operation risk, legal tax, audit compliance. Uh, this fall and the spring, uh, I may teach a FinTech course or part of a FinTech course. I teach a course on products and markets. I teach a course that is on what it is, and it's something we'll talk about when I do this, uh, if we get together again this summer. Uh, what we didn't talk about, and I'll show you what I want to do next time uh, we all get together is talk a little bit about the specific types of businesses uh, and markets there are that are out there. And uh, hold on for a second. Let me stop share. Let me screen share. Uh, where is it? Stay with me for a second. Screen share should be down at the bottom. Yeah, I'm looking for the, the right presentation. Oh, okay. No, that's not what I wanted to do. Stop share. Screen share. Sorry, this always happens to me. Um, is it risk? Sorry, everyone. Control functions. I just want to show that the, that finance 101. Maybe I can find it here. 101. Nope. Wow. Even recent. Finance 101. There it is. Kara, is Finance 101 showing up now on the screen? No, no, it's not. All right, let me just, uh, this is the one problem I have with Zoom is that I, I never know when, within a certain application there. Now it is, right? Yep, you got it. Okay. What I want to talk about next time, assuming that, that, that there's interest, is I want to talk about the different career fields in finance. Because I think that, again, when I got out, I had, I, and I, I remember doing this, I remember sending notes to people, I'm interested in, in, I'm interested in sales and trading, and I'm interested in municipal corporate finance. Now, that's like saying, that's like calling a human resources manager and saying, well, I'm interested, I might be interested in being a truck driver, or I might want to be a prima ballerina. You need to have a focus. You need to understand what the jobs are because the jobs are very different. What I'll do next time, and, and we'll leave a little bit of time for questions now, is I want to talk about the different career fields within finance. And I think this presentation, there are some things in this presentation that are, that are actually really good. And I think the way it's broken out are, is very useful. There are a couple things that I found that uh, there was somebody, somebody confused uh, accounting finance with corporate finance, which is not, which is not the case. And I, and I go into that in more detail, but what we'll do next time. And uh, Kara, if you think there's interest, I'll, I'll happily do this is talk about what is retail banking? What are the businesses that are retail? What is corporate finance? What do portfolio managers do? What is the insurance business? This is a lot, this stuff. And the reason why uh, I, I think this presentation is very good. This is what my, my springtime course is about. What are these businesses? What are these markets? How do they behave? So, so we'll, 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 we'll take it from there. If people want to do that. Yep. Uh, it, sound, it sounds like there is interest for it. So we can chat about putting another uh, workshop up on the calendar. All right. I will post this present Kara, I will post the, the presentation I just, uh, I just gave uh, as well as this, up uh, this, this uh, finance one-on-one, I, I want to work on that a little bit more, but I will send it to you. This one I just gave for you to post. Yep. So what we could do is I can email it to the participants that were here today. Um, so they just need to make, you just need to make sure if you're an undergrad that you logged into the kiosk and if you're a grad student, I'll share it with the um, grad department. And um, we'll also be putting up this entire workshop on our YouTube channel. All right. 
And in the meantime, just so you know, it's uh, that's my email. I do not mind getting emails from students. A, a lot of times uh, you'll say, how do I prepare for this job? And, and don't expect me to send you a paragraph. What I'll do is I'll send you, I'll send you some, I've read hundreds and hundreds of papers on different businesses. Uh, and that's not an exaggeration. I will send you the ones I found most useful. If you, uh, if you say, Ken, I need to understand about the power business because I managed to land a job with, with Pacific Gas and Electric as they're coming out of bankruptcy and I, I need to understand this. I know where you can go to get that information. All right, I can, I can, uh, I, I know the web sources. I know which Khan Academy lectures are good. I know which things from the government are good on basic finance. And I'm, I'm happy to provide that with you. So don't be shy. You can always email me. And, and uh, if, you, if, you don't, if you don't get back, if you don't hear back from me right away, email me again. I, I promise I won't get mad. I promise I won't get mad. All right. They're, um, they're, they're noting in the chat that they didn't see your email. So. AbbottKC at gmail.com. Oh, it's posted everyone in waiting room. That's why. I just, uh, mm -hmm. I just put it in there for you. There we go. Uh, and I'm happy to, I, I'm happy to provide it. Look, I, I love you guys. I admire you all. I, I love the, the, the spirit that I see at Baruch. It's, uh, I, I, I have the best job in the world. I, I tell my boss that all the time. I, I truly love what I do. So I'll, I'll hang around uh, for a little bit if people want to, uh, if, if people want to ask questions, because we said we still have 91 people. It'd be hard to, to entertain 91 questions but I'll hang around for a bit. You can probably stop the recording now if you want, Kara.